You're listening to The Lowdown Show. Mamma mia! Your NXT review and discussion show. We are NXT! Right here on No Holds Barred Wrestling Podcast. How's it going, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Lowdown Show, episode 111, your NXT TakeOver Brooklyn 4 and SummerSlam review right here on No Holds Barred Wrestling Podcast, your Canadian wrestling podcast. It talks about the WWE and No Holds Barred on anything we say, pun intended. Uh, I'm your host, as always, the self-proclaimed greatest host, and if you are watching the YouTube version of this podcast, you can see here that I am joined by multiple uh, guest hosts on the podcast today. So we'll introduce the regular host and we'll introduce our very special ho- ho- co-host. Uh, number one, he is the host that runs the West Coast, Hollywood Michael Chow. What's going on, Michael? Oh, hey. Hey, guys. <laughs> I would love to be more enthusiastic, but I literally just finished SummerSlam. The whole seven hours, so I'm a little bit drained, so that's enough from me. <laughs> We're also yeah. joined by the regular host, and again, we fooled a lot of you out there on that great work that you and uh, Brian did. He is the main event Maharaja, but now known as NXB, Brian at Heel Turn 21 on Twitter. What's going on, Brian? Hello. Oh. What's up, guys? What a glorious... SummerSlam weekend. Oh, God. Hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. We're ready to hand out some Randy Orton handshakes. Let's do this, people. <laughs> uh, and now joining the podcast uh, for this special episode of our TakeOver and SummerSlam review. He is a co-host of That Ass Podcast, guys. Go check him out on Twitter, That Ass Podcast. Uh, go give him a subscribe and go follow these guys on Twitter. He is James from That Ass Podcast. Thank you for joining us, James, on this uh uh, sure to be fun review show uh, for today. Thank you so much for having me. A uh, pleasure to be back with you guys. Thank you. Uh, good meeting you, Brian. I heard you. Uh, you know, made some waves last week. Yep, that's what I do. WWE style, make waves and get the ratings in. That's what we do here. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, guys, as you can, as you heard in the intro, brand new intro that I've created for the podcast. So kind of like there to be tries to say that they're refreshed after SummerSlam, we're actually going to do it the right way, and we are going to refresh. Got a brand new intro, brand new theme song, beautiful layout done by the beautiful Cyrax, who is joining the live chat on Spreaker, so go ch- hit up Cyrax for any graphical work you guys do. He does graphic work for us, he does graphic work for James and That Ass Podcast, he does it for some other known podcasts out there, Solid Monster, JD from New York, so go hit him up on Twitter if you guys enter need, or need any some uh, bleh, need some graphical work. Uh, we're also in talks of designing a new logo. As you can see here, where Brian's face should be, uh, his webcam <laughs> is uh, not working today, but he gets the generic No Holds Barred logo. That logo will be revamped, so we're in talk, so be prepared for that. Um, guys, we have a couple of ways you guys can listen to the podcast. Um, you can listen to us on Stitcher Radio, iTunes, Spreaker, and now SoundCloud. We are now on SoundCloud, so we have a new platform. If you are a SoundCloud listener, you know what that is. Go check us out on there and follow us on there. And if you want to listen to us on the go on SoundCloud, we are now going to be available starting with this episode on SoundCloud, so it'll be uploaded to all those platforms as soon as this episode is done. Guys, Spreaker is a glorious podcast app as well. as allows us to do our live shows. You can chat with us with everyone on the live chat right now. Uh, lots of wrestling discussions while we are doing the show. You can listen to all previous episodes of the podcast as well. YouTube.com slash NHBWR is where you can find our video versions, as you can see here, with this beautiful layout, like I said, done by Salrax. Um, and you can see our, our beautiful faces. All our YouTube podcasts are posted right here as well, so hit the subscribe button and the bell icon for all upload updates. And last but not least, sponsor the show, ExtremeWrestlingShirts.com. I still got to get a graphic work done for the new ad. 
Uh, but guys, go check out ExtremeWrestlingShirts.com. They are official sponsors of this podcast. They specialize in amazing WWE merchandise with shirts. As you can see, the shirt I'm wearing right now, this is from ExtremeWrestlingShirts.com. It's a special Kevin Owens Fight Owens Fight shirt that is <coughs> not made on WWE Shop, but they have exclusive shirts on this website too. I can vouch for them. Their quality is top notch. You're not. You're gonna. You're gonna skip out on a lot of fees you're paying with WWEShop.com. So go check them out and use code No Holds at checkout and you'll save ten percent on your order. And also go check out WrestleRumble.com. They are our friends at Russell Rumble. We do a pick 'em contest every single WWE pay per view. Guys, go check them out and enter in all their podcast or all their. Uh, their contests you can win cash prizes you can win uh, replica championship belts you don't want to miss out on this pick em contest so go check them out at extra, or, uh, wrestlerumble.com <sighs> wow what an intro that was long that was lo- i think that was longer than SummerSlam. i don't know i couldn't <laughs> hold on hold on hold on let me let me let you breathe really quick and uh make a quick quick observation so last week me and kyle work michael and he's been crying all week about getting work now he brings this to Jabron on the show to back him up. We oh. see what you're doing, Michael. We see what oh, you're doing. Oh, so Jabron. If you, want, if you want to go at this Brie Bella, Daniel Bryan, Miz and Marie style, well, me and Kyle will take you guys on anytime. If, if, if I could just say real fast, I don't know if these guys are trying to work me again, but this coming from a guy who is now nicknamed himself NXB because now he wants to review NXT after that horrible oh. piece of garbage <laughs> show they call SummerSlam. I mean, my oh. goodness. Hey, but yeah, that's cool, least... too. I mean, you guys can call me the Braun Strowman of this podcast, and you can call Kyle, and you can call Brian the self-proclaimed shield as they both try to work me over. So. <laughs> At least you know what? At least I'm sticking but with the theme. But you guys can pick who is Roman and who is the other, so. I'm, I'm sticking with the theme at NXP. You bring this jabron on with a Lucha Underground shirt. He's lost. Oh, this is the wrong podcast, buddy. I don't know what's going on all, here. First of all, Lucha Underground is the wave of the future. Second of all, um, this coming from the person who has Hulk Hogan as his picture, the racist. Oh, you are racist. Oh, oh, <laughs> We're you starting off hot brother. today. We are starting off hot. <laughs> are we talking about that? Are we still talking? Are we talking? Oh, are yeah. oh, we you talking know, now? If the Hulk, we talking you're not now. Part of the Brotherhood, brother. Me and me and the Hulkster, we don't see color. All we see is the Brotherhood. <laughs> the White Brotherhood. Oh. oh man, <laughs> is that what we're talking about? You stepped into that, you dude. Okay. Anyway, so I'm gonna just <laughs> butt in. I'm gonna slide right in here and uh, show some love over to the chat. We got Tiffany uh, that from that as podcast. James's co-host on, uh, or James' other co-host on. Uh, One talk host, Tiffany, and for everyone, we will be. I'm back on Dad Ass Podcast on Friday. We will be doing a show. It's going to be free for all. We're going to talk about everything, um, 80s, 90s, music, movies, whatever you want. We're going to be talking about it on uh, that show on Friday evening, around seven o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hello, Tiff. What's up? Now, James, can I get a little tease for this show? Now, you you must know what I'm going to ask. Are we going to get the return of story time with James and Thomas the Toy Engine? There will be a story time with James. Oh! There will be. I'm not going to say what story I'm going to read. It may be Thomas the Tank Engine. I don't know. I recently saw Christopher Robin. So oh. we may have to throw a Winnie and the Pooh story in there. I'm... And I got plenty of those right. books from my childhood. So, you know. All right, so for you guys that are fans of Dad's Podcast, you know what I'm talking about. Check out Free For All on Friday. So, Tiffany, what's going on in the chat? We also got Datila. What is going on, Datila? We also got Salarex, the guy, like I said, who makes all our graphic work. Uh, so go show him some love on Twitter. What's going on, Salarex? And I don't believe there's anyone else. Yep, Cubagirl125 is joining us in the chat as well. What's going on, Cubagirl? And, yes, uh, she sent in some tweets. I got a lot of fan tweets this week. I actually have also a... Uh, text from a good friend of mine. He listens to the podcast on his way to work, um, and he's really big into NXT, and he's got a massive prediction for NXT, which I'm going to read when we do the TakeOver review. This was hit, this text message he sent to me, guys, I'm, I'm all for it. Usually uh, I got my own way of thinking. You know, I'm a Gemini. I have, you know, it's one way or the highway. Um, but his, his, uh, his thinking around it, and his prediction is really good, so we'll get to it when we get to uh, the predictions here. Um, but, uh, 
Guys, welcome to the Lowdown Show. You don't know what it is, where we review NXT every single week. Um, it, this is our big, uh, since there was barely NXT this week, we do the uh, review for the pay-per-view before, and this week, or, or this weekend was NXT TakeOver Brooklyn 4, which again didn't disappoint. Shocker. And we also have uh, Summer Slam, sorry, Summer Scam that happened mm-hmm. on Sunday. Cause that really summer Snooze. Was, <laughs> summer Snooze. <laughs> Whatever you like to call it. I, I, I can just tell you right now, I was asleep by the end of the pre-show. So we'll get into that when we get to talk SummerSlam. Um, but before we start everything, I have something I have to get off my chest. And it's a gripe that I've I, I've been having for a few days now. I've been trying to, if it's not worded properly, I do apologize. Because I've been trying to put it into perspective and trying to put it into words here that make <clears> sense. <throat> but literally, it's been ticking at me and I've been reading it all over goddamn Twitter. It's about people defending what Derby has been doing this week and lately. And my biggest gripe is when they tell us, shut up, stop complaining, and enjoy it for what it is. Unacceptable. I'm, I'm sorry. You're telling me I'm supposed to accept mediocrity because I think that something is wrong and should be done a different way. It's wrong. So you're telling me your way of thinking is right and mine's wrong. And you're calling us the problem. No. That's not it. One, the product is bad. Regardless, I don't know where, what world you're living on. If you're watching WWE TV right now and you're thinking nothing's wrong. You're thinking they're doing everything right. Everything is A-OK. It was an enjoyable SummerSlam. It was entertaining. For one, it was not entertaining. Yes, Derby, the main roster is all about entertainment first. They don't care about the matches. They don't put any work into the matches. And don't tell me I'm wrong. Don't at me. They do not put anything into their matches. It's all about the entertainment. Number one for them, they can sacrifice anything else just to put it out there. What we've been getting has been absolutely horrible. Literally, it's been... You look at it. SummerSlam was, what, a total of almost eight hours long. Eight hours long. How do you expect us to love something and, and enjoy something when you... By the time we get to the middle of Summer Sam, it's okay, let's try to wrap it up quickly here. You can tell with the crowd's reaction. But then you get the people on Twitter that say, we're wrong. Every, they're doing everything's right. Every, the, the way they're pushing Roman Reigns is right. They, we should be pushing Roman Reigns. We should ex- shut up and accept it. No. Mm-mm. You wonder why I don't watch Raw or SmackDown anymore. You wonder why I don't want to review Raw or SmackDown anymore. Because the main focus is on Roman Reigns, and even in that, they're doing it the wrong way. I wouldn't mind Roman Reigns if he was pushed a certain way and his character was delivered a certain way, but it's delivered the wrong way. Like, there's no questions asked here that Roman Reigns is pushed the wrong way. And I'm sick and tired of people on Twitter saying, shut up, accept it, watch it, and enjoy it. I can't. So you're telling me if I'm going to watch, let's put take it as something else. Um... What are people into now? Like keeping out. I can't. I can't think of a TV show. Simpsons. Simpsons, for example. Michael Chow. Well, I can get you in on this. Say there's an episode of The Simpsons that. Or, it's actually what's actually happening now with The Simpsons. Michael Chow. I don't know if you've been watching the newer seasons. It's actually been terrible. Uh-huh. I, I right? haven't, and this is actually a really good example. I don't watch anymore because the product, honestly, is really not good anymore. <laughs> I've been watching a lot of DVDs, which I buy of the older seasons when it's good, but nowadays it's really – they've lost their way. The show keeps getting renewed, and I'll let you go ahead and talk about this, but that's actually a really good example. I'm just like, – even not now even talking about it, I'm just – I'm sick and tired of, of getting told – to shut up and accept the product for what it is. It's fun and entertaining. I really want to know what is entertaining to them. That they keep pushing Roman Reigns, force-feeding him down our throats week after week after week after pay-per-view after pay-per-view after pay-per-view. It's not working. They're not, he's not getting the reaction they want. They don't know whether to... They, like, they're saying he's a heel, but he's not a heel. What they did was not heel whatsoever. I don't know where people are getting this thing that, that he was a heel at SummerSlam. No. Don't don't give me that shit. He's not a heel. <laughs> the same thing goes for Becky Lynch, we'll get, which we'll get into. <laughs> I'm just I'm sick and tired of them sacrificing the product and giving us rinse and repeat garbage over and over again. Look what we got on Monday Night Raw this week. Everyone thought, oh, wow, what a good SummerSlam. Everything's going to change now. No. We went right back to status quo. We went right back to square one. We are in the same. It's a fucking little circle. And we get up to the end of the circle. Or, or it comes back around, and that's basically where SummerSlam was. We're just going to repeat. We're going to rinse and repeat the same garbage. 
it's it, everyone's like, oh, it's better now that we have a champion on TV that is actually on TV. It's the same fucking thing. It's a guy that has a title that we don't like and don't want on him. It's the same thing that we wanted on Brock. It was the same thing on Brock Lesnar. He was a guy that carried the title that we didn't want on him and wanted off him. It's exactly now what's going to happen with Roman Reigns. He's going to be force-fed into every fucking main event going forward. He's going to beat all our favorites, and we're going to eventually want the title off of him. Tell me what's different now. And let's not forget the fact one reason why a lot of fans don't like Roman Reigns is he goes over on unnecessary talent. What do you do? Yeah, Roman Reigns saying, gee, who's going to get my first title shot? Should the Raw GM decide? No, I'm going to randomly pick Finn Balor. Why not? And apparently he's, apparently he's Balor, a GM. <laughs> he's the GM. He makes the rules. They don't bring up the fact that Finn Balor has a rematch clause. They could have at least said Finn Balor has a rematch clause. Finn Balor go out there and say, I'm going to cash in my rematch clause right now. But no, they do this. They recycle the shield. They recycle the fact that Ronda Rousey assaulted Stephanie McMahon and nothing's going to happen to her. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if that main event of evolution is going to be Stephanie McMahon and Ronda Rousey? Oh, my God. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And she walks around like she invented all of this. And, and and for the morons, if I may get something off my chest. Yeah, go ahead. For the morons on Twitter, for the social justice warriors that want to attack Dave Meltzer, go back to 2001 when Vince had Trish Stratus on her knees in March of that year leading up to WrestleMania 17, and Trish Stratus was barking like a dog. If you go back to the Wrestling Observer... Dave Meltzer attacks Vince McMahon for doing that. If you go back to 2009, you know what this company decided to do to Mickey James, of all people? Fat shame her and call her Piggy James. And you know who was the orchestrator of that? Michelle McCool, the Undertaker's wife, who was able to run roughshod in that locker room and do whatever she wanted. You think people forgot about that? How about Nia Jax, who gets fat shamed every week? Kevin Owens, every now and then, a little fat joke pops up every now and then in a promo about Kevin Owens' weight. Yeah, Kevin Owens goes out there and makes Braun Strowman look like a million bucks. Goes out there and takes ridiculous bump after ridiculous bump. He had a bad back when he came out of Ring of Honor. There's no way that back got any better. I don't know how Kevin Owens is still wrestling 300 days a year. He's got to be at the most impervious to pain body next to Mick Foley I've ever seen. But Roman Reigns is a universal champion. But Roman Reigns is a universal champion. We should push him. It's all about him. That's right. Owens has a little extra cushion, so he should be okay. This is why we, we <laughs> review up. NXT. It is night and day difference. NXT, you are invested in every single goddamn character. They make every single character important on that show, regardless if they have a title, regardless if they're in the beginning of the card, regardless if they showed up once every month on NXT. Like, the Street Profits are coming back next week. I bet you they're going to make them look like a million bucks, and it's going to be all exactly. about them. You watch the main roster and the main product, especially Monday Night Raw, they focus on one fucking guy and say, fuck everybody else. You don't believe me? Look who the fucking Raw Tag Team Champions are. You're telling me that the B Team is a legit contending team on Raw. Why? Because they've made them look like shit beating... Did you see how they beat the Revival? This is what I mean. Oh, my God. That ending think was about, Think pathetic. about this for a second. The Revival, AOP, and one half of American Alpha are on Raw right now. Right now, oh, oh, and there's and there's no compel there's no compelling tag team matches whatsoever. Your Raw tag team titles were on a pre-show in front of a half-empty arena, and you still made them retain. You give them a shitty ass new theme song. It's annoying as as they are it's, as a team. Like, and I'm not criticizing Bo Dallas or. Or, or or Curtis Axel here. Curtis Axel should be pushed in the mid-card level. He should be at the top there, man. The guy comes from... Look at his wrestling background. The, the fact that his wrestling background... He ha- who his father and his grandfather were... And he's not getting pushed away like a, a, another third-generation star... Um, Randy Orton is... Is a sad truth. Because Kurt a- Curtis Axel can actually wrestle. Bull Dallas is a former NXT champion. 
but you're putting them together with a fucking goofy t-shirt and a scribbled B and a terrible theme song, and you're expecting me to watch the main roster and not complain about that. It's, Give me it's a amazing. break. It's, it's, it's amazing. Well, I just don't understand it. Well, since terrible. you guys is, you guys had got stuff off your chest, I had told you I wanted to get a little rant in myself. Oh, God. Um, but before that, um, the B team, the B stands for Brian, so I have absolutely no problem with him. <laughs> oh, champs. Um, but if I may get serious for a couple minutes here. Mm-hmm. I have been watching wrestling since I was a little girl. I was literally about... I don't even remember how that. old I was. I, you know what? You are sexist, sir. Anyway, um, which is part of the problem. I'll get to that later. Um, <laughs> we, I, I have been watching wrestling forever. I don't even remember a time I didn't watch wrestling. I watch wrestling with my daughter. She's three years old. She knows all the theme songs, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I get where they make stuff for kids, and I get where... They make stuff for us, the wrestling fans. But it's literally gotten to a point where I don't even care anymore. And it's never been like that. I'm talking about the Ruthless Aggression era, the Attitude era. Just some of the worst time in wrestling. This is the worst time in wrestling. They're catering too much to that part of the crowd. Like You should be splitting it down the middle. 50% for the kids and the casuals. 50% for the people that enjoy in-ring product. And in-ring work, but they're focusing literally 90% on the kids and sacrificing the in-ring work, which is making the product terrible. And they're wondering, oh, I wonder why we have the lowest ratings in 25 years. Because well, the audience duh! never grows. The <laughs> audience was, never grows. It was always a, a perfect balance of this is for the adults, this mm-hmm. is for the kids. Going back to freaking Doink the Clown was for the kids until they turned them heel. Bret Hart was for the kids. You know, mm-hmm. we had freaking too cool with Rikishi for the kids. But we still had good we, in-ring product. We had, but there was had, still there was you split. still had the you still had the Austins. You still yeah. had the bad guys. They, it was it was fun. I used to get home from school on Mondays and be like, oh man, you know, a couple more hours till Raw. Now I fall asleep before the thirty third hour even starts. SummerSlam, WrestleMania, these things used to be huge things. We used to have parties when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Freaking WrestleMania parties with 10, 15, 20 people. Like, people don't even watch all year, but they came to watch WrestleMania. Exactly. Just like SummerSlam. This past SummerSlam, Sunday, I had a friend come over that doesn't even really watch wrestling. And he's like, dude, this is, a, this is horrible. He's like, why are they booing the guy that just won the bout? I'm like, you don't even, I can't even explain <laughs> this anymore. You know what? People, <laughs> people shit on, on how bad SummerSlam was. And, and you know what? It was, it was bad. I wouldn't say it's the worst pay-per-view. It was okay. But as soon as Roman won that belt, and we all knew it was coming, I literally just it just it just sucked the air out of the room for me because I was like, dude, this is Brian. They ruined it ridiculous. for me when they got Braun out and he grabbed the mic and said words oh, that made him that literally I've like lost an, all hope for him. He, he looked a, like an idiot. You're he a monster among and, men, monster and you beat monster. the fuck out of everybody, and you don't care mm-hmm. about anything and anyone. But you're mm-hmm. gonna tell me you're gonna come out and wait for two people to weaken themselves for you? <laughs> and then he, he he sounded like an idiot. He said, "I I'm a man. I'm not a coward. I'm not gonna come out after you guys beat each other up. I'm gonna wait outside the ring, and after you beat each other up, I'm gonna cash in." It's the same fucking thing. It's exactly the same scenario. You, you, well, what's you know, the difference? You know who I blame? I blame the guy, the green fatty in the front row. That's who I blame. <laughs> Freaking smiley face man. Yeah. I mean, how dirty was that shirt by the end of the weekend? <laughs> oh God! I mean, oh. I was in. I, we were in New Orleans, James. Can you imagine him on Bourbon Street? That, oh my Bourbon God! Bourbon Street's a different level of dirty. <laughs> oh my God! Jesus! Oh. Ugh. My my my. Bourbon Street was fun, is... but like, don't look at the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're That's right. You're saying. right about that. Oh, you're right about that. You'll see some things you don't want to see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, come over to LA, we'll, and then we'll talk. <laughs> Okay. I've been to L.A. I know yeah. what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, my, my beef, you know what? And, and people say, you know, Roman is the problem and this and that. It's, like, it's not Roman. It's creative. It's it's Vince McMahon. Because, you know, Roman, I, I'm, I'm in a popular opinion here, but he, he's been carried to pretty good matches. You know, he when it's a, a type mm. of gimmick match or something, he, he's... He's not any worse than I don't the know, Rock because he's only faced Brock Lesnar in the last year. But, so I but I'm, what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is, he's not any worse than the Rock was. He's not any worse than Austin was. 
If you go back and watch these old tapes, Rock did a, a freaking People's Elbow, guys. If Rock did that nowadays, people would be shitting on it because they want five star matches. Well, the, Ro- is, the Rock still had the people in the palm of his hand. He didn't have to. He, 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 he had the charisma and the character, character to back him up. Yeah, the Ric Flair promo charisma. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. But we're talking. I'm talking in ring ability. They, they, but that's why I mean, not Rock had that to back Balor it up. Circles about round of if you're talking like if you break it down that way. Yeah, yeah. but what I'm saying is creative wise, they have yeah. nothing for these guys. You know, what I mean, it doesn't matter if they go out there and wrestle a five star match. Yeah. No one's gonna remember that Roman's in a month. In ring People... work is is a, is a small part of it. The big part of it is how they portray him and how his character is portrayed and how they are literally doing the complete opposite of what should be going on with Roman Reigns. It, yeah, they they really are going out of the. It's like they have a vendetta against their own fans now. It's like exactly. let's troll our own fans. It's very obvious they're doing it. It's very obvious by Vince McMahon's tweet today. Thank you for everyone in Brooklyn for the for the weekend and the picture of Roman Reigns. Oh God, yeah, that's, and that's my point. What I'm trying to get to is they're literally just. They're being stubborn about this. I wasn't trying to say Roman can have a five star. And they're uh, supposed to be a professional it, number one company. Let's just put that. Let's keep that in in mind here. We're supposed to be professional and not let the fans get to us. We're supposed to stick to what we're going to write for certain people and try to make the show better and get out of the goddamn ratings rut that we're in because they know they care about ratings. But no, no, no. We're gonna go out of our way because we want to fucking toy with the the smarks out there. We want to mm-hmm. shove it down their throats that we're gonna push this guy no matter how much you fucking complain. We're exactly. gonna sacrifice the product because we're gonna keep focusing on Roman Reigns and nobody else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my point is, you know what? Let's just say you you do want to keep focusing on Roman Reigns. Okay, let's just say you're gonna insist on pushing Roman. Fine, have him come out on Raw and say, you know what? You guys wanted the belt back. You guys wanted it off of Brock. But F you guys or, or something to that extent. Turn the guy heel. Mm-hmm. He, he doesn't have to. If you want to bring the shield back, which, I mean, that's just that's a whole nother thing. Every time Roman wins, he's going to freaking have the shield protect him. It doesn't make any sense. They just bring out the shield because they want him to be cheered. And they know that's going to protect him from being booed mm-hmm. out of the building. Mm-hmm. So have the shield come out. Whoop everyone's ass. Have them all a, a heel faction. How, you can have the bout on Roman. He doesn't have to speak much. Now he's exactly. with the shield again. Have Braun come out. Braun can talk. Have Balor come out. Balor can talk. Right. So you have right. your top talkers in those two guys, and you have your top heels in the shield. What is so hard about that? Yeah. You get to keep get... your belt. You get to keep your belt on Roman. That's yeah. fine. That's okay. Cool. But just just switch it up. It's it's just literally the same thing for the last three four years. Mm-hmm. So I am going to cut in here, which we're going to move it along, I guess, or else this podcast is going to last 18 hours long, and we're going to last longer than SummerSlam. We don't want that. We want to keep it short and simple, just like TakeOver. And speaking of uh, NXT TakeOver, we are going to do a switch it up here, and we are going to talk about NXT TakeOver Brooklyn number four. And uh, before I get going, guys, so I'm going to take the realm of you know, the head guy for talking about NXT TakeOver. Once we switch over to the SummerSlam review, I'm letting uh, Michael Chow take over for that, and he'll be the head guy talking about that. And because SummerSlam was, you know, 18 hours long, we are going to keep it short and sweet and keep it down to two to three minutes for each discussion of each match uh, going through SummerSlam. So as for NXT TakeOver Brooklyn, I'll be taking the helm. And again, like I say every single goddamn time in this podcast, and I always predict it, and it's always it always comes and it's always true because it happens every single time this weekend comes around. NXT Takeover always surpasses the following WWE main roster pay per view, and what happened this week or this weekend? Same exact goddamn thing. I enjoyed Takeover Brooklyn Four so much that I rewatched it during the day before SummerSlam. The whole thing, from start to finish, I rewatched the whole entire thing, and I was not bored. I didn't skip through anything going, yeah, I already seen this, but I want to skip to this part. I rewatched from start to finish. One, so I can get these notes right. Two, so I can get a, a second feel for it. Because whenever you're reviewing something, you kind of want to watch it again to get like a second perspective, not your initial thought. And there's a lot of stuff that I did change my mind on. Um, TakeOver Brooklyn 4 was amazing from start to finish. They picked the right match order, I thought. Uh, I didn't uh-huh. think the, the woman would call me an event. I thought for sure it would have been the North American title, but it wasn't. I think they still did a good job with it. Um, but NXT TakeOver 4, guys, I, I want to hear all your guys' initial thought before we get into the matches. What was your initial reaction? We'll start with James. It, I mean, 
any superlative that I say is just not going to do it justice enough. I mean, these 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 shows are the benchmark of how shows should be done. I'm sorry. I mean, the fact that a takeover can intrigue you and enthrall you and make you care about every single person on the show top to bottom that tag match was amazing everything entrances outfits we have so much to talk about Mm -hmm. it was just phenomenal i mean how they continue to make every takeover better than the next i mean it's going to be scary to see what they come up for survivor series weekend in November and for the Royal Rumble weekend and for WrestleMania again, it's going to be great. And I can't wait for it. There's so much to get into, so I don't want to waste any more time. Yep. I just, I, I, Triple H, you're amazing. <laughs> Thanks. Michael, Thank what was your initial thought of NXT TakeOver? It was great. And, you know, Kyle, I've only been watching NXT for a whole year, but it just seems like every every single takeover I watch, it keeps getting better and better. Right? And now, you compared think... to the main <laughs> roster. Yeah, exactly. Main You're roster like, how are they going like... to top this? But they keep doing it. They keep topping it. <laughs> exactly. Main roster just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. I mean, I, I used to run an old podcast, and Kyle and James, you were both on there for my year-end review. We both all mutually agree that last year was the worst year in the WWE. This year might actually top it. It, it just seems like main roster keeps getting worse and worse. I don't know what to say. Uh, back to TakeOver, it was great. A lot of surprise winners that just I, that was great in a good way. Mm-hmm. There weren't like surprises where I'm like, What the hell was that? Was that a swerve that just left me disgusted? These swerves, these surprises were all great. Everyone who won deserved to win, and they just did it. They just did it great, and it's only going to get better. And it's just very odd when you think of NXT as the minor league brand. You always think that the minor league is not going to be as good as the actual main thing. But this minor league called NXT is always doing so much better than the main roster. But that's enough for me. Brian, I know you watched TakeOver. What was your initial thought of it? And, guys, he is full NX. He's NXT. <laughs> he's full NXT now. The, the whole work, he's not, that, all that was a pre-worked fight, and he, he's on board with NX, er, NXT. And uh, I really want to know, uh, now that we are serious about it, uh, Brian, what was your initial thought of uh, whoa, 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 real, I'm sorry, real fast, before Brian says anything, it was a work that you guys got into an argument, but I just want to say it was real that Brian used to back up the main roster as much as he could. Like he truly believed in the main roster, but it just got to a time where Brian finally just, it was like the main roster started to get really, really bad. Me and Kyle could see how stressful it was for him oh. to watch the main roster and review yeah. it. And this and is why to cut Brian doing... off again. Breaking news folks. Cause he's not in the pocket. My former coach, uh, corporate Cappy, he is, I'd say he's around 80% on our train now. He's sick and tired of the main roster. He's, he, he's, he's literally had enough. He's actually, he's not going to Raw or SmackDown. That's coming to Toronto next week, which, um, by the way, apparently they're going to announce SummerSlam next year is going to be in Toronto at the Rogers Center. So they're doing a massive baseball stadium SummerSlam next year. If you guys remember, Roger Center is oh, also yeah. known as Sky Dome, which was the... So WrestleMania the 6, WrestleMania yeah. Uh, and WrestleMania 18. Yeah. So uh, apparently that's going to be the big announcement next week. So you know what? I'm stoked for it because of the TakeOver. That's going to be sick. TakeOver Toronto 2. That's going to be interesting. But but I read that they Triple H wants to stay in Brooklyn because he's treating it as his WrestleMania and he always wants it to be in Brooklyn, which I'm fine with. It just mm. sucks because if SummerSlam's coming up here to Toronto, my ho- like literally an hour away from me, ah, I wish it, Takeover was there too, so I can go and experience that and say fuck SummerSlam. I'm gonna stay home, um, but I am gonna go up there and ex- do the experience the whole SummerSlam week. I might go if the tickets are cheap enough. We'll see, but that's a big announcement. But yeah, Brian, uh, initial thoughts on Takeover Brooklyn Four. <laughs> well, I I pretty much not to sound pretty cheesy or anything, but. The word I can use for NXT in, in general is exciting, you know, and that's what's missing from the main roster. Not cheesy you're exci- at all. You're excited to see, um, like James said, the, the the entrances, the wardrobes, the just the minor details that I feel the main roster just doesn't care about anymore. Um, the the storytelling in each match keeps you excited. You know, you 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 end the show excited for what's next. 
I have I haven't been excited for a Raw or SmackDown in years. Mm-hmm. But just a, a two hour or two and a half hour uh, pay per view and a one hour weekly show keeps you I- excited. That's the best way to wrap it up for me. Right. It was amazing. Like it dated from start to finish. Another pay per view well done. And uh, we're gonna get right into it right now. Um, the crowd was night and day louder than SummerSlam. My God, I don't oh. remember a crowd louder than this. They were not tired at any point throughout the entire pay per view. There, half the time they were standing up, they couldn't sit down. When you have a crowd that can barely sit down because of how exciting the matches are, I don't understand. Yes, people tell me all the time, oh, NXT is in WWE. Well, you don't you think they're getting controlled by uh, the Vince McMahon and all this crap? If it is, why aren't they doing that on the main roster? If they're seeing how successful they are, why aren't they doing it on the main roster? <laughs> There's no way Vince has any input at all in what NXT does. That's why I don't believe it when people say, oh, how do you know Vince is not behind it? No, he's not. There's no, no, he's break. not. There's do you, no you think way. he even knows half of what's going on there? Do you think he even watches the takeovers? No. No. He's like, I'll leave that in f- to you, Triple H, because they're the minor leagues. I don't give a shit about that. Oh, it's from those it's indie marks. Me. Yeah, this is for the, the, the smarks. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> every promo for every match was amazing for the card. It got you hyped for the match. The promo team behind NXT, they're on another level. They're the best in the, in the whole company. Um and it's funny how SummerSlam has all these rematches from, you know, we call it basically Extreme Rules 2.0. Uh, TakeOver had almost the same amount of rematches. But were you bored at any of these rematches? Were you no. pissed off at any of these rematches? No. Because no. the difference here is NXT, quality, logic, storytelling, everything done right. Dare to be. They only put rematches on a Darby pay-per-view card to fill their 8,000-hour-long pay-per-view with no logic or story behind them. That's the difference between takeovers and how Darby pay-per-view main rosters are built. Um, yeah, and if I can really quick, yeah. last show we were talking about, this has to be it for Gargano and Ciampa. Like, we're getting tired of it, and what do they do next, blah, 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 blah. Now I will like, get well, into that. This isn't I, it. Well, <laughs> yeah, I got some. Yeah. I got a theory yeah. for that, too. <laughs> yep. Which we, and I got the text message for that. We'll get into it. But we'll start off hot here, and this is how you start a pay-per-view. This is, And it's because the NXT Tag Team Division is incredible right now. And people are... It, it's it's such a night and day difference from the main roster. It, it sucks because NXT division, their tag team division, is thriving right now. But the potential on the main roster from all these former NXT tag teams is that they could be doing so much better on the main roster. They could probably be blowing NXT's tag team out of the water, but they won't. And they don't because they don't focus on stuff like this. This is, what, the third time this team is facing each other in the last mm-hmm. month and a half? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. they just put on an epic... Match that you're you, you're on the edge of your seat for the entire match. I was on the edge of my seat for this match. This was so well done. When you have matches like we've been getting all year long in this division that are consistently good, you get a thriving, watchable division on NXT, and that is their tag team division. I just don't understand why we can't have this on the main roster. Why can't why can't we? Because they don't care. They don't add me on Twitter. They don't care. They they do not give a flying fuck about their tag team division. You don't believe me? Look who the tag team champions are. The B team, and they're putting it on the New Day for the 800,000th time because they have this agenda of making them the tag team that has the most tag team titles for whatever reason. And I, I don't want to give New Day the gripe. They're a good team, but I'm sick and tired of them winning the titles every other time. That's just, it's to me, it, you're not doing it properly. It's, it's too predictable. You have to stay out of the box. You have to like, get creative with them, and they're not. They're literally just giving them the titles for the sake of making their title reign Mm-hmm. grow like there are more titles on them as for this match undisputed era wow were they mm-hmm. ever over holy Ooh. shit this is probably the loudest un- uh, reaction that i got and this is without adam cole this was just roderick strong and bobby fish <laughs> it's tough they, they're supposed to be in a way they're supposed to be the heels here but there weren't any heels in this match and that's one thing nxt doesn't are not afraid to do as well uh, are putting two te- or two people together or two teams together that both get a babyface reaction and let them go out there and just tell a story. And the story between these two teams is amazing. We 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 know the story behind this with the last time that they faced each other with Tyler Bate uh, throwing in the towel. 
uh, on, for Trent Seven, his his mentor, and, and them losing the tag team titles and Andrew Spadaro gaining them back. They played it well in this match. There's that one spot where Trent Seven's on the ring apron, and you're on the edge of your seat going, oh, shit, is he actually going to throw it in? Is he going to throw it? Like, they did such a good job to make you believe that Trent Seven was going to throw it in, and then he turns around and whips it into the crowd. Amazing stuff. This was such a great match. That great spot with the towel. Undisputed Air eventually hitting their finisher. Um, Strong playing the part of Bobby Fish during that that Undisputed Air tag team finishing move that they do. Uh, the, the Red Dragon finisher. And they retain the titles. All I got to say is that's how you open a show. I'll leave it up to you guys now. Absolutely. Because, I mean, when you watch this this tag team match at times... Reminded me of and you know the um, Heart Foundation against Demolition in SummerSlam '90, where you're waiting for Jim the Anvil Nightheart to get the tag because Demolition beat up Bret Hart and beat up Bret Hart and be- and it it, it kind of was along the same lines in the same way where. They were t- taking out Tyler Bate, taking out Tyler Bate, and Trent Seven sitting there on the apron. It's like mm-hmm. he sits there on the apron a little more longer. You don't know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. So like, and then once he got the tag, it's, uh, it was such a great hot tag. And mm-hmm. when do you see that in the main roster? A hot tag actually be a hot tag. Right. I mean, it, it, the the crowd went crazy, and Undisputed Era just knows how to work a match psychologically. They know how to, even though they're getting cheered. They find a way to get booed in the middle of the match. Yep. <laughs> they find a way to make you hate them. They do dick-like stuff. They, it, I mean, they came out of no. Roderick Strong, who I, who I used to watch for like eight years in Ring of Honor. Mm-hmm. I, I never watching. knew he had this in him to be a heel. Never. I mean, he is doing it perfectly. Yep. Oh. The cockiness I, he has too, like it's just he's playing. Oh, it's it beautiful, spot on. I mean, um, the Bobby and whoever would have thought that an injury was a good thing, with right. the Bobby Fish injury. Oh my God, just beautiful, just great stuff, man. I just was marvelled at it, and like you said, this is how you open up a pay per view. Right. Michael, yeah, what did you think of this? Or we'll go Brian. Brian NXB, the new, the new, uh, <laughs> new NXT uh, no, uh, Mike, horse. Here. Sorry, Michael, I'll make it really quick. The the one thing I took away from this is. NXT realizes it's so easy, it's stupid. You beat up the little guy the whole match, and you make the hot tag for the big guy. Classic. Just just a classic big guy, little guy match. Like, it, it's just so, mm-hmm. it's so easy. Mm-hmm. And and sometimes, they, like, you know, the saying is less is more. Yeah. This was the, the most basic of matches. Mm-hmm. And it was still better than anything on SummerSlam. And they mm-hmm. told the story right. The the story. Yeah, it's, it's just so easy. The little guy gets beat up, yeah. and the big guy. Misses I mean, the eight. history of these two teams. They played it all into this match. Yeah, the, the, from yeah. the towel throwing to the one spot, the very very smart spot of of, Trent, of the referee dealing with Trent Seven, and then it, Roderick Strong coming off the pole, like coming into the in the ring and dragging Kyle O'Reilly while he had that submission oh. lock and dragged him over to their corner with and it got back quick enough by the time the referee turned around. Yeah. <laughs> like bravo. Going, bravo. Going going back to the to the towel throwing and everything involved in the story, it's always been the the older, wiser guy protecting the little guy. And this match was just that, that it was that's all it was. It was mm-hmm. the, the the teacher protecting his student. The little guy getting beat up and the teacher right. making the save. It, that, it, basic. Basic. Easy. Michael, thoughts on this match? I know you have something to say about this. Well, I'm not going to let Brian outdo me, so I'm going to try and make it as <laughs> short as possible. So, unlike the main roster, this uh, tag team match was not in the pre-show, and then they had to resort to a stupid uh, DQ finish. It was great. All of these guys could, you know, function as singles wrestler. They were all good. And, man, it was... There were so many different moments in this match where I thought it'd be over. That amazing uh, tag team finish by Mustache Mountain was that that uh, burning hammer. Burning hammer. Hammer. They pulled a lot of Japanese. There were a lot of Japanese moves in this match. I don't know if anyone pinpointed this. There are a lot of Japanese moves done in this match. Also, Trent Seven uh, channeling Okada and pulling off a Rainmaker Mm mid-match. I'm going, what the fuck? <laughs> and the crowd knew it. They know because yep. we're all smarky. We know what the hell that is. And they all yep. knew it. They're all like, oh shit, he did it. <laughs> yep. Uh, but yeah, this, this 
This is incredible. When you have a crowd giving standing ovations every other minute in this match, you know you have a tag team classic. These guys could mm-hmm. open up a pay-per-view from now on, and I would not have a problem with it. They just set the bar again. There was that tag team that happened on NXT a couple of weeks ago that set the bar. These guys just met the bar. It was just another tag team classic. It was great from start to finish. The right team uh, retained here with Undisputed Era. Mustache Mountain's going to go over to the WWE NXT or UK tapings, the UK NXT tapings from now on. They'll probably be the first tag team champions over there when they introduce the tag team belts over there. Uh, so, or maybe they'll split and they'll do some singles work over there. So they're all off over there. As for Undisputed Era, they get attacked by the War Raiders after. So <laughs> even more adding to this match, they get the War Raiders coming out of nowhere and beating the shit out of the Undisputed Era and laying them flat, making it known that they are coming for those tag team titles. Um, wow, wow. Oh, yeah. So that's going to be. I'm. I'm. Is is. I'm assuming. From now until War Games, they might get... I'm going to assume that there's going to be a tag team title match between these two teams, but there's going to be some sort of outside interference that's going to lead to the teams building up for the War Games match yeah. uh, going yeah. forward from here. So, um, Well, I, I just want to say, when you have a tag team named War Raiders and they're not in a pay-per-view called War Games, then that's just plain stupid. And something that the main roster would do. So, come on. Yeah, they'd, War stick on the, they'd stick them on the pre-show. Pre-show, yeah. Why not? <laughs> But it's uh, going to be interesting to see the tag team division going forward here in NXT. Very, very exciting stuff. Um, so, other than that, again, like I said, great match. We had the Burning we had a burning Hammer, a Rainmaker. We had uh, that sixth spot by Tyler Bate on the outside with uh, Roderick Strong, him bouncing. He does that spot bouncing off the ropes. Like, Tyler Bate's just amazing. I can't wait for that guy. Guy's still young, too. But uh, speaking of young... Another young guy making a name for himself in NXT. We moved on to EC3 against the Velveteen Dream. And uh, <laughs> we got to talk about it right off the bat, guys. The back of Velveteen Dream's uh. trunks. Well, unfortunately for him, he never got that call. So bad news for <laughs> Thank him. God. And I want to <laughs> point something out that Triple H said in his interview that he did after the Facebook interview. I went and listened to it. He talked about it. He goes, that's, that's pretty cocky stuff. But uh, he goes... He says something, and I'm like, yes, Hunter, yes. He's like, sometimes the call isn't always a good thing. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And we all know what he meant. Let's not try to look into it. We know oh, what yeah. he meant. It's exactly what you think it means. For everybody that wants to think that, oh, Triple H, you know, like he's, he's on board with everything. It's comments like that, that goal, you know, little comments like that where you know he's not on board with mm-hmm. the bullshit that exactly. goes on on Monday Night Raw and SmackDown. Mm-hmm. Where he sees creation after creation after creation go to catering or get booked into oblivion. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't, how, well, I don't know how was... Triple H can say that when uh, his former NXT superstar Roman Reigns is the world. <laughs> <laughs> just, just throwing it out there. If someone on the main roster should wear trunks to say, uh, call me down, Hunter. <laughs> Send me down, Hunter. Someone please do it. <laughs> like, I, Oh, man. But, oh, and uh, by the way, uh, I don't know if any of you guys realized it, but um, the Velveteen Dreams vest, that was a shout-out to the, the Notorious B.I.G. I heard, I read that. I was wondering what the what people were talking about, and I read about that. That was uh, The yeah. guy includes everything into his out. That's why this guy, is, he's 22 years old, Patrick Clark. And literally, he's already the complete package. The way he presents himself in the match, his in-ring work, his character, he plays 100% spot on. And other podcasts are saying this. I think Velveteen Dream is one of those guys that plays his character outside of work. When you Absolutely. see him out in the streets or something, he's playing the Velveteen Dream. Mm-hmm. He That's his. That's him, That's himself. Like He's all about that character. And he's it's like, a, uh, what is it, a Matt Hardy. Matt Hardy is always broken. No mm-hmm. matter where he goes, yeah. he's broken Matt Hardy. Velveteen Dream is always Velveteen Dream, no matter where he goes. And he plays that character spot on, and the way he incorporates his his outfits. We look at the last takeover, he fucking made fun of Hulk Hogan by almost dressing like him. And uh-huh. and he wore the same trunks of uh, Rick, that Ricochet wore back when he was in uh, um, Lucha Underground and, uh, Ring, of, and Ring, Ring of Honor. The exact same trunks. Uh-huh. So he was trolling him. So It's great. Yeah, Dream Dream is obviously studying... The Miz, dude. The Miz lives 
the Miz character to to a T, you know, when mm-hmm. he's on TMZ, et cetera, et cetera. Velveteen Dream is doing the exact same thing, and it's great. Yeah. I think this match lived up to the night. <clears throat> I think it did everything it needed to do. Uh, one thing that a lot of people I saw, the criticism they're giving it, that it, it was kind of like a, a slow ending, and it didn't seem right, and it was kind of like... Uh, EC3 and it was not really into the match. I think, and I, from what I'm reading, he had a mild concussion from that spot on the outside where uh, Velveteen Dream did that sick inverted DT oh. that he does. But it kind of looked, and you can hear it if you go back and watch it, EC3's head smashed off that steel. Ring. And he started, he was bleeding too. Yeah, and he, you could tell by when I rewatched it the second time, his bell was wrong. I oh, got my bell wrong a lot obvious. of times in hockey. You can tell that he was – he's. Yeah. I'll applaud him because going f- after that spot, he kept the match going as best as he could, and he delivered a lot of spots. But you can so tell that he was he was not 100% into it. Like he was yeah. – half the time he's in his own world. But for what we got, I thought it was a great match. I thought mm-hmm. it was – Really good. Uh, There's a lot, of, again, the, the stuff with the ending, but Velveteen Dream, amazing. Um, again, I don't think a lot of people are giving it credit for what it got, what we got. Uh, yeah, we probably could have gotten a little bit more, but I thought it was fantastic. It was good enough to not try and overshadow the rest of the card because you know mm-hmm. these two, if they actually were giving it 150 to 200%, they could probably overshadow every other match in this card. So I thought the storytelling in this match was key. It was right on. The, the build for this match was amazing. Um, I think Velveteen Dream needed to win after that big loss to Ricochet. So a lot of people were disagreeing that Ricochet probably could have, or uh, Velveteen could have taken a loss. I disagree. I think he could have. I think this is a perfect time for him to win. Uh, EC3 is the one that could take the loss in this count, in which he did. Uh, from here, Velveteen Dream, I think, should be pushed into that North American title spotlight. Fuck the call up. Let's not talk about that. I think that was just. Uh, I, I hope that was just. Uh, uh, a, a jab at Vince, um, but I think him and Ricochet could have another rematch later down the line for that North American title. I, I'd, I'd, I'd welcome that. As for EC3, in my thinking, in my booking, I'd love to him for him to have another ego crashing feud. It's going to be out of left field here. Tito Sabatelli. I think both these guys' egos are almost the same. <laughs> Them <laughs> clashing against each other, that'd be perfect. Have these two guys have a match against each other. I'm, I'm sorry right now. I'm just I, you guys can't see it. Maybe on the YouTube. <laughs> but when you literally said that, James' reaction. I, I'm guessing he's one of the people who are just a bit confused <laughs> it's, by it. It's left field. I know it's it's out of there, but you have to <laughs> exactly. hear. I just you gotta get so shocked. That was, I'm, and I'm thinking about Tino Sabatelli's theme. The money come, right? The money go. These guys are almost <laughs> identical. Right. We, we all started laughing because we all had the same exact expression when you said that. We were like, "Wait, <laughs> okay." Because I mean, where are you going? Where are you, uh, who are you going to push him against? Where are you going to put EC3? If you're not going to call him up and you're keeping down an NXT, who is he going to go up against? It's kind of wrong place, wrong time with EC3 right now. Right, it really is. Mm-hmm. That's I, what I mean. You, that's why you 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 do you you have a little small feud on the side. Tito Sabatelli has been on fucking TV since who knows how long. Have since them come back. Have these guys, Moss. right? Have them run into each other backstage, like going like, "Who are you?" Like Tito Sabatelli, like I'm the original big money guy around here. Who the hell are you, right? Like I, I've never seen you before. And then have their styles clash. I be- bet you they can have a decent match. I think they have. I think it'd be a decent feud, a decent minor card feud that they could have against each other. I don't know how they feel about Tino Sabatelli in backstage. I don't know how they yeah. feel about him. Yeah, I don't know either. It's weird how we haven't seen him in a long time. So Yeah. Well, uh, he's yeah. he's currently out on a on a uh, injury. That's why he hasn't thought, been on oh, I thought that was well. Riddick Moss that got injured. Yeah, yeah I mean, but, speaking of injuries, you brought up the injury to EC3, and uh, I went back, and I was like, man, where did he get injured? I thought it was his face, but you know, that's just his face. That guy's pretty goddamn ugly. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, but what did you think of the match, Brian? Um, it. I I wasn't a fan of the first half. It seemed a little slow, which is what a lot of people seem to be saying. Um, it did pick up. You know, it, the the high spots came, and it, it it was it was it was good. It wasn't bad. It just it just felt a little slow for me. 
And other than being scared by EC3's face, it was it was it was okay. <laughs> yeah, the beginning was a little slow though, but I mean, you know that they, they pick it up by the end. You got to account for the the bell rung thing, and I do understand that. I've I've gotten my bell rung in sports before. And it's 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 really hard to keep going after that and try to focus. So, I thought for where we got after that spot, even like the ending was. I thought it, it was a really good job. We had freaking Velveteen Dream and again pulling off stuff that's just amazing. Patrick Clark is amazing. That big yeah, uh, elbow drop that he did onto EC3 while he was on the edge of the ring apron. We did, he did that uh, Death Valley dr- Driver drop, the, the Dream Ooh. Drop or whatever he calls, on the edge of the apron too. So for what we got for a match to not overshadow every other match in the card, I thought it was good. I thought it was decent. But uh, mm-hmm. Michael, I need to hear your thoughts on this. I actually really enjoyed this match, and uh, I just really didn't know who was going to win. I, we kind of hinted at the fact because, you know, Velveteen Dream was kind of getting jobbed out in this uh, build toward this pay-per-view, so it wasn't really shocking that he actually won in the end. Uh, I thought this was actually EC3's best match he's actually put on since joining NXT, and Velveteen Dream, this guy can work with anyone, so... Yeah, we'll have to see where it goes. And mm-hmm. for me, since you picked Tino Sabatelli as his next feud, for me, honestly, it, it's kind of tough because they really – his gimmick has kind of changed. They, we, it, it looks like he started out as a heel, but now he's kind of walking backstage. He's kind of giving compliments out to random people. He's kind of doing like a Bobby Roode, kind of like he's smiling. So it's kind of mm-hmm. like he's in the middle area. Mm-hmm. For me, if they kind of want to go toward the baby face side – I think EC3 versus Adam Cole would be a pretty good feud, but uh, that's just me. And for Brian, I just want to say, to call him ugly, you need to leave Dixie Carter's nephew alone. Okay, pal? Go ahead. <laughs> okay. I mean, sticking on that topic, I, it's very easy on where EC3 goes next. Baszler lost the belt. Baszler versus EC3 oh in a like, plastic Stop surgery it. match or something. I don't know. <laughs> face mask it's on the pole. It's your ridiculous. Plastic <laughs> surgery match. Oh my One thing I want to point God. out, someone said it on a podcast I was listening to. He said, like, can you imagine he goes up to the main roster and Miz and him have like an epic promo against each other? And imagine Miz goes, what does, actual, what does EC3 stand for? Huh? <laughs> and he puts oh, all that, that, to make oh, him That's say exactly it. what Miz would do. He would ex- exactly what he would say. Do you imagine that? <laughs> Do you think he says his name? <laughs> Ethan. <laughs> or he bring, makes up a name like Evan Carter III. No, no. <laughs> then, we'll have, then we'll have Dixie and EC3 versus Miz and Maurice at WrestleMania. Oh, my God. All right. Anyways, um, we're going to move on here. <laughs> um, North American Championship match. Uh, Ricochet versus Adam Cole. Uh, I was going into this thinking it was going to be the show stealer. It lived up to expectations for me. Um, Adam Cole is literally the next Shawn Michaels. The guy is, he look for one, he looks like Shawn Michaels, which is he, like he's, he's got a lot of resemblance. But he, I think he's just as over, if not more, than Shawn Michaels. Man, the guy is incredibly oh. over right now. So you just compared Adam Cole to Shawn Michaels, and Michael left. See. See what you did. Don't you ever anyways, compare anyone to Shawn Michaels. Anyways, uh, you can see the intensity in these guys before the match even started. If you guys go back and watch before the bell even rung, these guys were just like chirping the hell out of each other back mm-hmm. and forth. You can tell in their eyes that they're really into it, so they tell, told a good story right there. Uh, it was a good fight feel uh, for this one. Uh, very good tempoed match as well. I thought both guys were showing off their strength. Ricochet with the athleticism, Adam Cole with the quick, stable offense, and... Uh, the cockiness of him himself being the North American champion. You can see it throughout the match, slapping Ricochet around, saying, I'm a champion, you know, and just calling, uh, saying Ricochet this is not its moment, it's not his time. Um, love that there are a lot of near finishes, a very, very crazy ending, and uh, Ricochet is our, very, very shockingly, is our North American champion. This I, this was really, it threw me off guard. I really didn't think that Adam Cole was going to lose a championship here, but um, and thinking long term, I thought I think this is a good idea. I uh, thought uh, maybe we could have had a little bit longer run with Rick or with Adam Cole with the championship. Here, he didn't really do much with it. Um, but I thought this was a nice title change. There's a lot of good spots in this match. We had the big one that's like the gift that's been retweeted a million times: the 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 the, the moon salt from Ricochet into the super kick by Adam Cole. It's literally up oh. there with Shawn Michaels and Shelton Benjamin. If you guys don't remember that, yep. Um, 
that spot was insane, man. Oh. And it, it, it rung Ricochet's bell too because if you look at pictures after, he had a black eye and his eye swelled mm-hmm. up. So he, when, I love when people say, "Oh, wrestling's fake." Um, uh, I don't man, not all the time. Uh, anyways, huge um, super kick from the moonsault. Um, and that big spot with Ricochet, that out of the ring Hurricane Rana, the athleticism on Ricochet is literally oh. on another level, man. That spot to end the match was amazing, and then we got the six thirty on top of it, the cherry on top. Wow, what a match! What a match! It lived up to expectations. There were all these rumors that, and it was almost confirmed that Ricochet was injured going into this match. Fuck, man, that guy literally swallowed it up and delivered an instant classic. I can't agree more. Um, I've been watching in Ricochet ever since Lucha Underground and Ring of Honor and around the Indies. Uh, it, he just continues to raise his game. He's one of those baby faces who never is out of the match. Like you never really fully believe that he's gonna, gonna be gonna he's gonna be defeated. And it's scary because he can do so many things from so many different angles. You, you know, the, the Hurricane Rana spot was just out of control. And Adam Cole is just perfect to work with. Right. He, he really is perfect to work with. Mm-hmm. And I can see your comparison with Shawn Michaels mm-hmm. because Shawn Michaels, when he really got into the sexy boy gimmick around 93, 94, around that period of time, he really became like a cool heel, and you started really – because of his in-ring work, you started really liking him. Yeah. And he started backing up everything he said. He wasn't really losing anymore. Mm-hmm. And Adam Cole was kind of like that same – from that same cloth. I'm not saying he's Sean, yeah. um, but he's from that same cloth where he comes out, you hear his music. He, it's cool. Like, right. And then everybody's doing the boom. Everybody, every like all eyes are on Adam Cole, mm-hmm. and you know something special is going to happen. But Ricochet is kind of like, he's kind of like Bret Hart, where you beat him down, you beat him down, you beat him down, and he's not done. He's he's gonna come out with some move out of nowhere. It's like he's playing possum throughout the match and looking for ways to get at you. A small package can come out of here. A Hirokarana can come out of here. An Asai Moonsault can come out of here. You don't know what the guy's gonna fucking do. It's just fucking out of right. control. So I thought the same thing. I thought Ricochet was going to lose a hard-fought match, especially since this was Adam Cole's first title, first real title defense on a major takeover. So I really thought they were going to let Adam Cole keep this title for a little bit more, maybe feud him with EC3, and then see where you end up from there. But, yeah, hey, listen, I can't complain about this. No. Ricochet tore it down. Ricochet did what he had to do, and I'm very, very happy. There's a lot of ways you can go with this. I'm thinking, I know this is out of the box. It's not Tino Sabatelli out of the box. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm thinking Ricochet could be feuding with the finest. Oh, all right. And and Michael Chow and Brian know I love Uh, this guy. The finest. Finest. Only if it's a triple only if it's a triple threat match, adding Cassius Ono. There you go. That one's for Cappy. <laughs> hey, there, I, threat think, match. I think he's one of the prime suspects for who attacked Alistair. I'm still sticking with that. Uh, I think he's. it's going to be a big heel turn for Cassius Ono. I, he's going to really I, revamp I, his character. I agree with that. But, uh, yeah, Ricochet. No, they tease something after TakeOver in, a, in an exclusive video, which I'm – I tweeted it out and it got so much reaction on Twitter. I think it's got like over a hundred likes and eighty retweets. They had a stare down between uh, Pete Dunne, yes, and uh, Ricochet. Mm-hmm. Take my money now! Take Unbelievable, it. Ricochet and Pete Dunne. Woo! That will steal the show. I thought this was that was that's going to steal the show. If these two have a match, forget about it. That's the main event. Anyways, uh, I need to hear Michael's and Brian's thought around this match. What do you guys think? Well, I think Pete Dunne needs to get involved in that uh, face mask on a pole match. Um, (laughs) But anyway, uh, Ricochet, Adam Cole. uh, The thing I liked about it is I've always said you you don't remember matches. You remember moments. And the thing about the indies is they're always more concerned about the magical. 
you know, the five stars. This match managed to do both. It gave us the five star match contender, and now you're always gonna remember the Shawn Michaels super kick to to Shelton Benjamin and the Adam Cole kick to Ricochet. You're you're just always gonna remember where you were when you saw that kick, and and that's what I liked about this match is it gave us the the five star Dave Meltzer match, but it also gave us a moment, and you're gonna remember that moment more than you remember anything else in the match. You're not even gonna remember who won the match. You're going to remember that kick. Right. And, you know, a little personal, I guess, note. I was there when Ricochet won the first Aztec Warfare, and he became the Lucha Underground wow. champion. So it was kind of one of those things where, like, oh, oh that's my that's my boy. He won, He's on NXT winning belts. Like, it was just a little – Ricochet has no idea who the hell I am. But I just mm-hmm. – being there to see him win Aztec Warfare to where he's at now, is just, it's just a good feeling. It's, it's one of those mm. that's, that's your boy type of deals. He is just on another level when it comes to like talent in the ring, man. That guy is just the the things he can pull off, and he's a good seller. Not only that, he can he has the athleticism that's beyond anybody else. The selling he does in the ring, is, which is mm-hmm. a crucial part. If you can't sell in the ring, you're not delivering a good match. He sells like spot on, spot on. And he, he's he's a great guy. After after the the taping, uh, I, I saw him in the in the parking lot. You know, everyone was leaving, and and. He was literally signing every autograph, taking every picture. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't go up to him because I was like, dude, this guy's tired. He just did freaking Aztec work for, like, let him go home. But he was stopping for every single person that would that was there. Great, great guy. Mm-hmm. Amazing. So, Michael, we'll still end it off there with you for this match. Okay. What would you um, think? I thought, I thought this was a great match, one of my favorites of the night. And, uh, man, both these guys are so over. I don't know where these guys go next. It was an amazing match. They both did great, much better than anything the main roster has done in years. And uh, I'll end it with a crazy hashtag mock child creative. I just, if you just notice right now, so we actually talked about this. War Games coming up, and I had brought up in the past that if they are going to continue with a, you know, a, a team of three people going into War Games, I said, you know, it wouldn't make much sense if Adam Cole remained the North American champion, and if Undisputed Era are also the tag team champions, entering in that match with two titles, like two champions in that match. So I'm gonna throw a creative thing out there. So I'm guessing it's gonna be War Games. The three teams in there is going to be Undisputed Era with Adam Cole, and Undisputed Era has their tag team titles. Next is actually going to be uh, Ricochet with War Raiders. Mm-hmm. Ricochet is entering in with the North American title. The third team to enter is none other than Mustache Mountain with Pete Dunne, and Pete Dunne is the United States champion, if you notice. Three teams, UK three champion. different titles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry, UK title. <laughs> That's so, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, three teams with three people representing titles. So what I'm saying is those three teams and whichever team gets pinned will gain the title of the, of the team getting pinned. So if that makes sense. If uh, Undisputed Era gets pinned, then the team that pinned them will gain the tag team championship. If uh, Ricochet with War Raiders, if they get pinned, then Ricochet loses the uh, North American championship and so on yeah. and so on. So three teams, three titles being represented in each Jesus. team. That's my creative. That's my creative thing. I like I the teams happen, there. But... The teams, I think, yeah. that more were, were were heading in that direction for sure. Mm-hmm. And you just look at the caliber of all those teams. Like, do you, if we thought the last War Games match was epic, and it was, that last War Games match was on another level. This one is going to top it, if not, be just as good. Like you have the British strong style guys uh, clashing with Undisputed Era and. You know, honestly, they are all amazing, like Roddy Strong, Adam Cole, and and uh, Kyle O'Reilly. Man, Kyle O'Reilly is probably my favorite out of all the Undisputed Era members. Not only because we have the same name, um, but uh, his his style of wrestling. I love his his kind of like MMA style of fighting is is, is amazing. I love his submission work. He's my favorite out of all three. I, lo- I love his in ring work. Um, and now you got the War Raiders and Ricochet. Like again, take my money, man. Like just take all, just take it all, take it all, and let me let me enjoy. Let, let me, I'll sit back, not get bored that the matches or the show is going to be eighteen hours long. Not going in and saying, oh, I'm expecting this bullshit. That's exactly what my thinking watching SummerSlam. But um, yes, uh, very very good prediction, Michael. And uh, I think mm-hmm. we're heading that direction. 
So uh, and it, it it makes sense because Mustache Mountain has previously teamed with Pete Dunne, and it looks right. like Pete Dunne's currently going to be feuding with Ricochet. And for anyone who says Ricochet and War Raiders as a team doesn't make sense, hello, last year Roderick Strong teamed up with AOP. So if you want to tell me that doesn't make sense, <laughs> then okay, whatever. Could but, you yeah. imagine to do a title for title? Because Ricochet and, and and Pete Dunne, like holy, oh my god! Which I, I it, it sucks because it won't be any, now that the UK title will be the official main title of NXT UK. Um, but Jesus Christ, man! Even those guys one on one is going to be nuts. Uh, but we'll move on here uh, to the co-main event, which was actually shocking because I didn't think this would actually co-main event. But uh, NXT Women's Championship, Shayna Baszler against Kari Zane, and you you hear the emphasis on why I say Kari Zane. One thing I want to point out that made me cringe while I was watching the pre-show for TakeOver Brooklyn 4 was driving me up the wall. I was losing my mind. I was literally about to rip my ears off. The way Sam Roberts says oh. Kari Zane's name drives me nuts. I don't know if this is the proper pronunciation of her name. Regardless of it, I hate the way he says it because his voice is literally the cringiest thing. Uh, it's like nails on a chalkboard. He says Kari Zane. Caddy Zane. Oh my god. And he was saying it so much to the point where I'm like, I think he's either doing it on purpose or I'm literally gonna about to I literally about to take scissors and cut my ears off. He's saying Caddy Zane. I'm going, Oh my god, please, just please for the love of God. And I don't know who he was on the panel with, but they're saying Kari Zane. I'm going and he kept saying Caddy Zane after. I'm like, Oh my god, please stop. Please do not say Caddy Zane one more time or I'm going to punch you through this television. But he kept saying it. It was so cringe. So I just want to get that out of the way that that was oh, So I highly horrible. suggest no one watch the pre-show. I don't know what I watch it anyways. I just had it on. Uh, anyways, this was a great women's championship match. If you want an example main roster of how to do a women's match properly instead of eight-man tags every goddamn week, <laughs> you need to look at this match and you need to mimic it. This was amazing. Uh, we saw a different side of Kari Zayn in this match, a very more intense Kari Zayn, more focused than ever. I think this is a more intense and more focused one than the last time we saw Kari Zayn and Shane Baszler met, which is uh, coincidentally a year ago uh, in the Mae Young Classic final for the first tournament. Um, the joint manipulation, I want to point out, sh by Shayna Baszler is spot on. I love the way she does that. That's a key thing for her, and the way she does it, she literally, it's almost as b uh, bad as when Pete Dunne does it. Um, it adds so much wow factor and intensity, I think, to the match when she does stuff like this. I think it makes the match more believable and more, uh, and, like I said, intense. Uh, the, tra the transition for of Shayna Baszler from MMA to WWE has been incredible for her. She hasn't been here that long, but for her... You look at her transition from when she first entered to now, amazing. Like, it, and she's old too. She's like thirty-eight years old, and she's transitioning at a very quick pace that she could be good for a while. Um, and I, I'm glad that she's transitioning this fast. I think at her age, she needs to be doing that. So I think they're doing a, a good job with her. Um, she's very tough. It's very tough to do transition from MMA to WWE. A lot of people don't know it's very, very tough to do. If you don't have it, stay out of the like. You know, you don't take the heat. Stay out of the kitchen. Uh, guys like Kurt Angle and Ken Shamrock, you guys look at those guys like those two. Like they transitioned from MMA to WWE uh, very well. So um, this was better than any women's match that I've ever seen in the main roster by far this year. Literally tops every single one of them. Uh, Baser was uh, too cocky in this match. Uh, very, very. Um, and you okay? So she's very cocky. And you add an intense Kari Zane who took advantage of this uh, near the end of the match, locking in multiple anchor submissions, weakening Shayna Baszler. Um, I love the ending where Kari was trying to hit the elbow and Shayna got her knees up and she freaking ended up elbow dropping the knees and locked in that clutch that she does. Uh, Kari Zane pulling off the reversal uh, the same way Ember Moon did. And a lot of people know that. This, if you go back and watch how Ember Moon beat Shayna Baszler, this was done the same way. So she basically flips over to lock in the shoulders or the arms together while pressing down the shoulders and beating Shayna Baszler and overcoming Shayna Baszler here. I don't know how you can't love this. The emotion you could see on Kari Zane's face uh, of her fight to get to where she's come and overcome the bully of the NXT Women's Division. This was very, very good time, I think, to change the title or the, 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 the title hands here. Because uh, I think they're going to be pushing Shayna Baszler up in the main roster, and I think she should. She's run her course in the NXT Women's Division so far. Um, again, this was 
Very, very well done. Uh, I love the spot. I want to point out a spot in the match where Kari Zane was fading away when she's locked into the clutch the first time. And the sell of the perseverance of just... Grab, like wait, the referee's about to call the match, and she suddenly woke up to grab the rope in front of her. Very, very well done. Um, so I really, really enjoyed this match. So uh, we'll move on to James. What did you think of this match? The this I want to put this in perspective because building on into this match, I thought that they screwed Kari Zane up. Like going into the going into this match, I thought they screwed her up to the point where there is no way. I didn't think NXT could do it. I didn't think that they could make it believable enough for me to make me want her to win this title. I got sick of this pirate princess garbage. If you ask Tiffany and if you ask Saurex in the chat, I had a whole plan for Kari Zayn for over a year to be dominant like Asuka, to be intense like Asuka, to be undefeated, and to face Asuka next year at WrestleMania, both of them undefeated, and for Kari Zane to finally beat Asuka next year in WrestleMania's, in WrestleMania's uh, main event. That was my plan. Now, they went with the Pirate Princess thing. I didn't care for it. And she tapped out to Shayna Baszler before, which a lot of people didn't want to didn't want to talk about um, because they wanted to keep on with that Mae Young classic and not talk about the fact that Kari Zane kind of fell through the ranks, tapped out, kind of was forgotten about this pirate princess garbage started happening. And then she faced Lacey Evans and she showed a little bit of a different intensity in that match when, you know, against Lacey Evans. Yeah. And I was like, OK. It looks like they're going in a different direction. And then they had her talk a little bit. And they kind of, you know, they had to talk a little too much. One, you know, for an NXT taping. But they did what they had to do. They showed the intensity. They're like, okay, enough of the games. She's coming after Baszler. Right. And, ba and you know, you just kept saying to yourself, Baszler's not losing. Look at what she does. And Baszler plays the bully. If you look at that Mae Young classic and what she's done now, it's night and day. What she's been able to accomplish mm -hmm. in the ring, shedding the green off. It's, right. it's just amazing. And even when the match happened, I swear to you, I was, was on the phone with Saurax during the whole takeover. And I said, the only way this match could end, I say one of two ways. Baszler chokes her out or Baszler has her in the hold and it's going to be an ending similar to Bret Hart against Roddy Roddy Piper at WrestleMania 8 where she'll use leverage and roll over and have her mm -hmm. pin her own shoulders to the mat because she's not going to let go of the hold in time or against Stone Cold Steve Austin, Bret Hart against Stone Cold in Survivor Series 96 and Madison Square Garden, the same exact ending. I said that's the only way this match can end because Kyrie Zane is... That, uh... He was locking. What's that finish? The the dream, or uh, not the dream? Um, wasn't it like Ted DiBiase's finisher? Yeah, yeah, the core, yeah. The, the, the yeah, like the million dollar dream. Yeah, that's it. And, yeah, and then he wouldn't let it go, and he got his shoulders pinned to the mat, and, and then and it was the exact same. Not she didn't use the leverage of the ropes, but this the the spot that you talked about with her fading away. I thought the match was going to end right there and yeah. there. I was like, oh, it's going to be like Bailey all over again in, you know, in Dallas, Texas yeah. against against uh, Asuka, where it looked like she wasn't going to tap out. And then she faded slowly away like Ember Moon faded slowly away. I was like, oh, it's going to be the same thing. And then once she grabbed that rope, I said, oh, she could win the match. And then when the ending happened, because when she missed the elbow yeah. and then Baszler up. Oh, Kira Fuda clutch. I'm like, she's dead. That's it. And Kira then Fuda the rope. Clutch. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kira Fuda clutch. I'm like, she's dead. She's finished. Mm -hmm. And then, and this, this is the magic of NXT. See what the main roster would do. You kick out of 17 finishers, and then the match <laughs> ends. Here and take over. You're in the hold, and you struggle, and then you hit your finisher, and you don't hit the finisher, and it looks like it's over. And the last drop of reserve. Kyrie Zane rolls her over, uses whole own leverage against her. Storytelling like that, I really didn't believe in my mind that Kyrie Zane could walk out of Brooklyn as champion. As that match went on, 
they made me believe yeah. that she should be champion. And how can you not feel good for Kari Zane? Like you, you oh. see the look in her face after she was crying. Like oh my god, the crowd like like finally said like. Like even the crowd, the Brooklyn crowd is freaking a harsh crowd. If they couldn't appreciate that, you know it wasn't a good time for her to to, to win the title. But they were a standing ovation for Kari Zayn. You could you have to feel for Kari Zayn here how, how she worked so hard to get to that next intensity level to face Shayna Baszler and and, and whip her ass and and. and and, and she knows she could have done it. She did it last year to me on Classic. She can do it again, and she she per, she went through all that perseverance. Like good for Kari Zane. But I need Michael's and Brian's opinion on this. We'll start with you, Michael. Michael, what was your opinion on uh, Shane Baszler, Kari Zane, NXT Championship or Women's Championship? Surprise finish, but in a good way. Like it, unlike the main roster, this was a pleasant surprise. Something you're not going to hear on the main roster anytime. But this was great. It's the third match in the trilogy. A great way to end it. Uh, I honestly believe that Shayna Baszler is going to get called up. I want to bring up one thing. So one of the last times that Shayna Baszler lost was against uh, Ember Moon, and Kyle you already talked about uh, it was due to a similar finish. Now after that match, Shayna Baszler, after getting being cocky and losing to Ember Moon in that in that pin roll she beat the shit out of mm-hmm. ember moon mm-hmm. in this match you know this is how you do it it's not, not going to be like oscar winning the world rumble ain't no one going to interrupt this kari zane winning her first title in, in in the wwe she got to celebrate it's how it should be shana Baszler rolls out of the ring she, uh, kari zane gets the uh, appreciation she deserves that's why i think she's going to get called up because it wouldn't make any sense for shana Baszler to beat up kari zane right. afterwards and then go up right. to the main roster right. um this was a lot better than the Mae Young Classic Finals. I was not a big fan of that Finals. I thought it was very lacking. This match was a lot better. Uh, I, I, I like the fact that – so Kari Zane, her push in NXT has been really up and down in a roller coaster. She's been up. She's been down. She's winning one week. She's losing the Lacey Evans Women's Rights another week. And the I kind of <laughs> The Women's Rights. But I, I, I don't know whether they planned this, but I believe kind of pushing the fact that Kari Zane – is the first person to beat Shayna Baszler in the Mae Young Classic. Until this day, she is the only person to continue to beat Shayna Baszler. Shayna Baszler has lost to no one in in the W. Well, I think to Ember Moon, but to to, to allow Kari Zane to get this win, I believe is really a push she really really needed. And uh, I will go ahead and end it with. Uh, I'm going to end it with this. It has nothing to do with the match. If you guys saw, Ronda Rousey was in the crowd. Of course, you mm-hmm. guys showed the Four Horsemen. Yeah. Uh, this is an exact quote from Ronda Rousey, and it might have been one of the most worst quotes I've ever seen. They showed Ronda okay. Rousey, and she says, and I actually wrote this down in my notes while I, while I saw it. Ronda Rousey, she's on the camera. She says, and I quote, that wheel doesn't do anything. She's not a real pirate. Kyle, mm-hmm. if you have that uh, Price is Right trombone yeah. please play it right now this is ronda <laughs> rousey to kari zane that wheel isn't real she's not a real pirate go ahead dun, dun, uh, dun, I dun. Have it. unfortunately i got rid of it but i'll put the <laughs> awful awful give this woman you paul Heyman. you gotta be kidding me awful i got nothing against ronda rousey but uh give her paul Heyman. she's yeah. not good anyway go ahead nxb take it over <laughs> uh, just two quick things here for this match uh one like I said earlier, what we're missing is the old school WWE, a little bit of everything. And Zayn is that in the NXT women's division. She is the the pirate, which I think most of us think is kind of lame, but the kids like it. But she's also the kick-ass wrestler, which we like. The adults like the kick-ass wrestler. She's going to put on great matches. She can storytell her ass off. And the kids are going to buy the stupid wheel and the hat and everything like that. What I'm hoping for her is that when she does get called up is that the WWE learns from the Bailey mistake. She can literally be the next Bailey, which was supposed to be the kids love her, the adults love her. Mm -hmm. Everybody loves Bailey. Everyone's going to love Kyrie. I'm hoping and I'm praying that's what happens for her. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Number two, we figured out who is going to defeat the big dog. We all have a problem on the main roster, with Roman being champion, Shayna Baszler is the man to beat the big dog. She's going to get Stop. called up. He will beat Roman Reigns. 
Michael. Thank you, Mr. Baszler. Brian, Jeez. she's not a man. She's not a man. <laughs> no, no, hey, hey had... this, ma- this makes sense. If you actually saw Monday Night Raw, right, you got the whole Shield coming back to help Roman. Can you believe Roman, Shayna, face-to-face, the Shield coming down. Then all of a sudden, you hear, and I don't know what the abbreviation for the words are. You hear the four horse woman. All of a sudden, you exactly. get Ronda Rousey coming from one entrance. You got Marina Schaefer coming from another entrance, coming in Shield style. There you go. Oh, we got a Survivor God. Series, the four horse woman of the W uh, of UFC taking on the Shield. Book I'm it booking in. it. I'm booking it now. The new beast of the WWE, the Mr. Beast. Shayna Baszler. That's ridiculous. She's gonna be the next Paul Heyman guy. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> I'm gonna move on from that. Uh, by the By the way, um, <laughs> as great as this victory is for Kyrie Zane, and I'm happy for her, it's all going to lead to Miss. Undefeated yeah. Bianca the Belair. EST. Yeah, exactly. The EST. Of She's NXT. the next one, and I think uh, I think a, a fellow podcaster of ours, JD, put it in perspective here. You give it to Bianca Belair by the next takeover, and you do what you've been doing with one of the NXT divas in building her up in another feel-good story. It's time for Candice LeRae to get her shot, and you build Bianca Belair versus Candice LeRae for the NXT mm-hmm. Championship. Our women's championship. And you go into that might story. I, might I throw this out there? You know, WWE with that, uh, if I may say, desperate creative move of announcing Alexa Bliss versus Trish Stratus at Evolution. Don't be surprised since it is a three branded pay per view between Raw, SmackDown, and NXT all taking part. I wouldn't be surprised at all. And James, get ready if they announce Kari Zane will now defend the NXT title against Asuka, the undefeated person from NXT. It's a match we want. It's something that yeah. they could possibly do, and it's a creative, desperate decisions that they need people to tune in. Like you know, Trish Stratus versus Alexa Bliss, and they gotta pump up this whole Evolution pay per view, and that's one way to do it. And it seems like something that WWE would do by announcing Kari Zayn versus the woman who could not be defeated in NXT. Put the Asians together. I'll put the Asians together. The the fact the fact of the matter, by the way, and I'll get this out of the way before we get to an actual an actual main event. <laughs> um, the fact of the matter that once again, Vince McMahon gets a cal- does a little calculated move and waits till not even thirty minutes after takeover to go ahead and have the audacity to announce that fucking match with Alexa Bliss For is a is downright awful. disgrace. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is a downright desperate sickening disgrace because they couldn't handle all of the positivity because they knew what they had booked in their vault and they knew that they won the chance in the world they were going to get all that praise for SummerSlam or we got to find a way to overshadow it exactly Alexa Bliss and Trish Stratus that is a one star match at best and maybe I'm being a little too kind when I say that. Let's oh, all calm down. You're not, because that's another thing that brings up on Twitter that people are defending is Alexa Bliss. I'm sorry. This goes out to Kathy. Miss, Miss who doesn't want to take a bump? Exactly. She, uh, when, if you can sit here and tell me, please, if anyone can, I really want to know, and I really want to go and rejudge it. Tell me. I'll wait. I'll wait. What was the last great Alexa Bliss match? That she was the one to put over the person and make the match look good. I'll wait. I'll wait. We're we'll waiting a long time because there isn't one. Exactly. There isn't. I, 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 well, I don't know. I thought that Alexa Bliss versus uh, Bailey in a Kendall stick on a pole match was quite good. No. <laughs> well, am I the only one? No. Anyways. Oh, Bailey does still They do use. this. Might as well put Judy Bagwell on the pole. When they have <laughs> legit. Good women's wrestlers on the main roster that would be an entirely not, it instantly becomes four stars. And we'll give it four Dave Meltzer stars instantly. If you add someone that would have made more sense here, they teased it at the goddamn Royal Rumble. Um, Sasha Banks, hello. They did that whole spot at the Royal Rumble. Or if you wanted to build this women's evolution thing and, and do some flashbacks, why not do Mickey James and Trish Stratus again? You're already doing Triple H and Undertaker for the eighth time. Why not do triple or why not bring back the feud of uh, of uh, Trish Stratus and Mickey James? Bring that up the history sense. they've had together. Why not? But no, you're gonna go the other route and just literally put on paper and show to the world 
Vince McMahon's infatuation with blonde bimbos. Not saying that Trish Stratus is a blonde bimbo, great wrestler. I'm just saying you can see his infatuation she's gonna have, here. She's going to have because, to marry somebody that doesn't want to work. Because <laughs> Alexa Bliss is literally the, is, is Trish Stratus of this generation, except she can't wrestle. Don't tell me that she can't wrestle. Don't at me. She can't can, wrestle. Can you imagine if Trish Stratus came in doing what Alexa Bliss did? Trish Stratus had to work. If she didn't work properly, no one was going to take her seriously. Can you imagine if Trish Stratus walked around and didn't want to bump and did the bullshit that Alexa Bliss does in the ring? Oh. The only she thing. She would have never gotten over the only thing I'm giving credit to Alexa Bliss, and it's very, it's very, very small credit, is that she's a good mic talker. That's it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. She's good on the mic. That's it. Nothing else. Besides that, nothing. And he, he, you guys notice something that's happening with the women's division, the main roster, that I've noticed, and it's happening a lot more now. Why is every single woman getting breast implants? Is there a reason? Is am I and am I not seeing this? Billy Kay. Peyton Royce, Alexa Bliss, Charlotte. Who's next? Carmella. <laughs> Carmella? Did she go? Car- sure. Carmella. <laughs> like, you, that's the way to get pushed. You get a breast, you get breast in place, you get pushed. Charlotte comes back, title. Alexa Bliss gets boobs, title. Or and then and she lost to Ronda, but you know she's not that far from the title again. You know they're going to have like eight rematches after this and try to build this whole bullshit with Steph McMahon and Ronda being the Steve Austin and McMahon of this era. It's completely oh, stupid, by the way. Just, um, just stop it. Anyways, hey. we're getting off track here. Uh, let's move on. We got to move on here. <laughs> getting off topic. We'll save this for the SummerSlam review. Um, the main event of the weekend. Not the bullshit we got at the end of SummerSlam. That's not my main event. My main event is is in uh, this side of the screen, if you're watching on YouTube, right there. Tommaso Ciampa, Johnny Gargano, last man standing for the NXT Championship. This was supposed to be Aleister Black with this. Um, Aleister Black being the, making it the triple threat because of his ruptured testicle, whatever the hell happened to him. Um, <laughs> he got to be taken out of this match. Um, but now we have uh, the last man standing match done by William Regal between Gargano and Ciampa. Johnny labeled this the perfect way. He labeled this match as the day the memory of DIY dies. And it sure did. Uh, I love when Champa comes out to no theme. That's real heat, Vince. This is real heat, not the fake <laughs> go away trash heat that we give to Roman Reigns on a weekly basis. This is that this is this guy gets this is the heat that this guy gets is amazing and it shows how a proper top heel is built in the WWE. You want a perfect example of that? You look at Tommaso Ciampa. Uh, another match, or another rematch for these two, and another instant classic to add to their repertoire, and another uh, match to add to one of the greatest feuds of this generation. And it's going to get better from here. They did such a good job in this match. Again, it, it, people say they're, like, they're bored of this match. I can't get bored of these guys having a match with each other. They... I know they they lived up to expectations of this match. They did a lot of similar spots to their other matches, and yeah, I do get the point where people bring up that oh well, their Takeover Chicago match is more intense. You you kind of have to not look at this match just for them to create more unreal spots. You got to look at the story. They're telling more of a story in this match rather than these uh, ECW type spots, man. You got to look into it, and you saw a lot of it in the end where. Johnny Gargano locks in Tommaso Ciampa with the cuffs to the to the Titan Tron, and you saw like Johnny Gargano was second guessing himself, and you saw that Ciampa was literally like saying like I'm sorry Johnny like let's end this, <laughs> and you know we know he was faking in the back of our heads, but like you could tell on their faces like it was second guessing for Johnny, and Johnny just said screw it, ran at him full speed, clocked him in the face with the knee, but also went full on too far and. Ended up busting his knee on all those uh, those uh, speaker racks or whatever they're called, those those briefcase things. And uh, Tommaso Ciampa here, right at the nine count, you can see we're like, oh shit, what's going to happen? He slips off the stage so he lands on his feet at the count of ten while Johnny couldn't get up because of his busted knee. Oh my, this was very, very well done. I thought this was amazing. Um, before I let you guys uh, talk about it, 
the future of this and where this goes from here is very important in that I had a thought and then I scratched it out once I heard this text me- or once I read this text message from my buddy of mine who watches this show and this is exactly my I'm going with this prediction as well so I'm going to read it to you guys here uh, I haven't gone over this with uh, anyone else besides this so uh, or any, any of my co-hosts here so I'll read it to you guys okay here we go so he writes and this is to my buddy I'll, I'll shout out his name his name's Nino good friend of mine he puts, keep Johnny off TV till January. This is to milk the injury. He's not actually injured. He's milking the injury. Have Ciampa keep the belt till then, just beating a few challenges along the way. Um, he could be added into the whole Alistair Black, who who you know, who you shot Mr. Burns kind of thing they're doing over there. Um, at the Rumble takeover, Ciampa is defending the belt until out of nowhere, Johnny Gargano comes out and costs him the title. By hitting him with, you guessed it, the crutch. The famous crutch out of this entire feud. Next few weeks on TV, have them just attack each other, either uh, back and forth or backstage or in the parking lot. Eventually, Regal comes out and says, enough is enough. He's had enough of this. Uh, these two. and had enough of them uh, destroying each other and, and uh, basically... Just killing, killing themselves, almost barely killing themselves. As much as I'll hate to lose the two of you, we can't keep you together. I've talked to Stephanie and I've talked to Shane McMahon and have contracts ready for you two. One of you goes to Raw, one of you goes to SmackDown. Uh, at TakeOver WrestleMania weekend, you will have these two do battle one final time in the first ever Hell in a Cell in NXT history. But as soon as it's done, one goes to one brand. They we they come out and say it. One goes to one brand. The other goes to the other brand. And that's how he would book from here on. Wow. wow. All right. Let me. Uh, while this is fresh on my mind, I <laughs> I like it, Kyle. But you're making it too hard. The way I thought about it was the takeover before the Rumble. You have Gargano cost Champ of the match by him interrupting. So he loses the bout. They go off air. What's going to happen, et cetera, et cetera. At the Rumble, you have Ciampa debut, and the announcers just milk it. Oh, he gets to escape from Gargano. He's free. The, the, the rivalry is over. Who comes out next? Ciampa or Gargano. <laughs> In a very easy setup until WrestleMania. It, it's, it's that easy. You, you have think they'll do one, it on the main roster? I think it's that's the way to do it. You, you keep... You, Gargano never comes back to NXT. They both debut at the Rumble, you know, one and two, or, you know, 13, 14. You, you have the, it's the road to WrestleMania. The blow off is at WrestleMania. It's that easy. I think that's exactly where they're going with this. The problem with what you, the problem in the holes in that story, Triple H, his power over that storyline would be gone. Yeah, Shawn Michaels and Triple H, all the work that they've been done behind the scenes, working with both of these guys, recreating what Shawn and Triple H did when Shawn came back in 2002, yeah. is basically what they're doing. Yeah, and all of Triple H's power would be relinquished into you know who <laughs> his hands. <laughs> I I, okay. I I I 100% agree, but I really think that's what what's gonna happen. <laughs> and he's and, right, though. You know where they're gonna go after Raw Rumble. Oh yeah, they're not the, gonna the appear on Monday Night Raw. They won't appear on Tuesday Night SmackDown. Two hundred five live with Spike. It'll, or it'll, the it'll be the WrestleMania pre-show. But <laughs> I I think that that would be the the smart way to go about it. The easiest way to go about it. The, the match was great. I loved it. My biggest the biggest thought in my head right now. Kyle, did you really say Shayna Baszler is a woman? Oh, my God. Stop <laughs> I it. Still, I mean, you're lying. Dude. We're you talking about lying. Johnny Gargano and Ciampa here. Anyways, oh. I need to hear Michael's uh, thoughts on this here. So we'll, we'll talk Whoa. about what the match the, the match itself at TakeOver, Michael, and where do you think this is going? Well, to back up, Brian, by the way, just want to say that Shayna Baszler was in the video. She's a prime suspect for taking out Aleister Black, so you never Thank know. You, we might see Shayna Thank Baszler you. versus Thank you. This guy. Black. And I don't give – I don't give Brian a lot of credit, but, you know, he has credit in that one. Uh, I thought this match was good. I don't think it was the best one they put on, to be completely honest. And, Kyle, I actually messaged you after this match. I was not a big fan of the ending. I did not like the the way they booked the ending uh, because uh, I just – 
it's 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 a last man standing match, and I really don't like the fact that when you guys really think about it, Johnny Gargano took himself out, and I don't like that. I really didn't. I thought it would have been a lot better, to be completely honest. Um, he he, to book it as fact that Johnny Gargano has handcuffed Tommaso Ciampa to that stage, and he's being a little bit cocky about it. He think he has the match won. I think it would have been a lot better if Johnny Gargano had gone for that knee. And then Tommaso Ciampa had slid off the the ramp at the very last minute, and basically Johnny Gargano. It would have made sense if that's the reason why, you know, because he was too all up in his head, concentrating way too much about getting his revenge. Okay. And in the end, he is the his own reason why he yeah. took himself out. So you're saying out. that if like Tommaso Ciampa at the last minute slid off to avoid yeah. the knee by Johnny, and he oh, took himself okay. out. Okay, yeah. that's I, pretty I, cool. It would have been. I think like that. Yeah. It, it would be yeah. like Tommaso Ciampa was basically. The cerebral assassin. Yeah, he's playing he, awesome. Exactly. He, he really outsmarted cool. him. But I don't like mm-hmm. the fact that Jordan Gargano, he connected with the knee, mm-hmm. but then he, he, his momentum took him off the stage. And throughout the match, you're seeing these guys going for a 10 count. There are even some times where it looks like they're not going to make it, but they use crutches to get up to the 10 count. I'm thinking to myself... Listen, I've never, I've never dislocated my KFAB knee before, but if you could use a crutch to get yourself up from the 10 count, why couldn't Johnny just... I don't know, put his hand on a box or something to get himself up, you know, but it's just, I'm thinking way too much into it, but uh, (laughs) you gotta look at it from what they're trying to do here. And um, I, the one spot I loved amazing was when Ciampa took the chair and put it on his knee and ran right in the Johnny Gargano to take out the barricade, but then started picking up everything from left and right. Even the ring crew guy he put on top of Johnny and he put the ring bell, the chairs, everything. I fucking died when I saw that. I was in tears. I I literally tweeted at Chomp at that point and said, you are a treasure. To I mean, it, it is amazing. The one thing I will say... I'm going to agree with Michael Chow, but I'm also going to say this and put this in perspective. I fully believe that the attacker should have revealed himself. And because oh, yeah, that's what yeah. I thought was ha- that's what I thought they were setting up mm-hmm. when Johnny had him hand. I thought the attacker was just going to attack him out of nowhere, reveal himself and then cause Champa to win. That's what I thought. Yeah, it's funny you said it because didn't Alistair Black tweet a picture of like the the NXT map they always tweet out about where they're going and it had to take over on it and he wrote I'm watching you like in like scribbly joker type lettering he tweeted a picture of that I'm going okay so Alistair Black's going to somehow make his presence known in this match but then we never do it so mm-hmm. I was very very confused on why he tweeted a picture like that if he wasn't going to do anything so but, I, by the way I wanted to ask Brian a question you um put out there that Champa should be cost the title by Gargano. Who is Champa losing the title to? Shayna Baszler. <laughs> <laughs> On a serious note, who do you think he's losing it to? Um, Kona Reeves. Why not? Uh, Tito <laughs> Samantelli. <I would. laughs> oh my god, that's not serious. Oh man, I would just I, give I, it back to Black. I mean, why not have Black have an actual? I don't think Black ever need. I don't think Black ever needed it. He just he was always outshined by the Gargano and Ciampa feud. He never really had the main event status as champion. So give him another run as as main event champ. Let him do his thing, especially if those two guys are going to get called up. It, it might be just together. me, but to me, I feel that yeah, Black's a guy that doesn't need the title. I think Gargano needs it at least once before he gets called up. Well, it needs to be done WrestleMania weekend NXT Takeover. You have the. New Japan show in Madison Square Garden, which I'm going to, by the way. You have that going on on the exact same night. That place is sold out. Triple H is going to do everything in his power mm-hmm. to make sure that that show mm-hmm. does not, that they're going to make you regret not going. Now, listen, I had to gamble and I had to make a choice. And I did make the same choice for WrestleMania. Um, you know, go to TakeOver WrestleMania weekend or go to ROH. And see Omega and Cody. I went to ROH and saw Omega and Cody. I kind of, I really regretted it. I should have went to take over New Orleans. Oh, that was, that was on another level. I that was yeah. probably, and I've seen two takeovers now in my life. Uh, I was in Takeover Toronto, and I seen that takeover New Orleans. There, it's going to a takeover is especially now <laughs> takeover and takeover now. It's like holy shit. But you're going to the G1 Super Card, and that's amazing. Yeah. And 
we bring up now Gargano should be winning there, and it just brings back to about the woman. Why not have Gargano and Candice LeRae win the championship belts at the same same time in the same night? You can have the women's match first. You have Candice LeRae coming out with the title after, confetti, them Mm -hmm. celebrating with each other and happy for each other. You know what? The crowd would eat that up. They would love that. That's the ultimate it, it, payoff right that, there. That, 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 that's a, that's the, the confetti coming down and them hugging. That's your fade to black on that pay-per-view. Mm-hmm. It's got to it's gotta be. I mean, like, you, because you can have Bianca Belair win that title, have a whole reign of terror of not being defeated, and Candice, you know, it, it, do the same thing. Candice LeRae can, can't get it done, can't get it done. You build it up to take over, and that's the culmination. Yeah, it, it's 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 got to be done that way. As far as I'm concerned, you can't put this on the main roster and have Vince and you know Kevin Dunn's fingerprints all over this. <laughs> they they will ruin it. They will they will destroy it. They will piss on it. It will be on the pre-show and it will be buried on a in front of a half-empty stadium. That's what right. that's what's gonna happen to it. Mm-hmm. It's it, it's the, it what needs to be done. That's why I say that Gargano needs to at least win the championship belt, right? Like, does, he needs to at least win it once before he gets called up to the main roster. And I, I don't think neither of those two are going to call up until maybe after next year's Brooklyn. I don't think they should be calling Aleister Black anytime soon. Like, all the guys that are in NXT right now. I can't see anyone that that could warrant a call up except Shayna Baszler or mm-hmm. a Lars Sullivan because Vince, that's that's. That's Vince's boy 101 right there, Lars mm-hmm. Sullivan. You know he's going to eat eat that shit up. But other mm-hmm. than that, I can't see anyone else right now that's in the, like, the main scene on NXT needs to be called up right now. They have enough people on the main roster. They can't even fit everybody on a three-hour show. So why call anybody up right now? Exactly. They're just going to become AOP. They're going to become all the, the recent NXT calls. They're just going to be pushed aside. For who? Roman Reigns. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Um. What a card. Brooklyn 4, again, like I said, they keep upping every single takeover they do. It gets better and better and better, and it makes you wonder how they're going to top it. I have 100% faith that they're going to top this one at the next takeover, which should be War Games. And if we saw how good War Games was last year, it's just going to be just as good this year uh, in it. Um, uh, November, so we have two months to build till then. That's what I love about NXT as well. We get a couple of months to build to the next pay per view, and they do such a good job doing it. We don't have a pay per view a month, or you come October where you have a glorified live event at a cricket stadium and a uh, politically driven pay per view that's all about Stephanie McMahon for some reason. So, mm. um, yep. And just a really difference. quick note, really quick note for you guys. I'm actually sitting down inside of Staples Center right now, waiting. For war games, so all this fantasy booking you guys have going on <laughs> is getting me excited. <laughs> well, save me a seat, Brian. Maybe I'll come down and watch with you. Um, but uh, that was a take overview, guys. And before we get into the summer summer review, I'm going to cut the Spreaker podcast short now, and I'm going to restart so we have a little bit more time because uh, we did go over the time I, I thought we were going to. So uh, for all of you living, listening live on Spreaker right now, I'm going to end it, and then I will tweet the link again on Twitter when we are back up, and then we'll get into the Summer Sam Review. But TakeOver, I'm, we're going to give it all a quick rating here before we go, and we're going to do it out of 10. I'm giving NXT TakeOver Brooklyn a 9 out of 10 for uh, this weekend. Uh, James, what are you giving it? Nine out of ten. I would have probably given it a ten out of ten. That way, that main event ended. It's 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 on the fence, right? You're on the fence. Yeah, yeah, yeah on the yeah. fence. On but that, I usually don't really have issues with the way NXT and main events. But that's the only reason that's keeping me. But listen, nine out yeah. of fucking ten. I yeah. mean, nine out of fucking ten. <laughs> When's the so, last yeah. time you gave a WWE pay per view a main sorry, exactly. rain roster pay per view nine out of ten? Well, it's been a long time. <laughs> uh, Michael Chow. Uh, well, I'm not going to give it the Dave Meltzer 5 out of 5, but I will give it the old Patton, Peyton Royce 9 out of 10. So there you go, Dave Meltzer. <laughs> Peyton Royce <Yeah>. 9. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> NXB, Brian, what are, you, what are you giving it? I would have given it a 9 out of 10, but for me it's an 8 out of 10. Oh. And that's only because, just one serious reason. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't think it's serious, but go ahead. No, Jim. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious on this one. That Shayna Baszler guy gave me freaking nightmares for the whole weekend. 
So That's if it wasn't for that and Jesus. EC3's face, I, I think it would have been a 10, a 9. Anyways, guys, those are our ratings for NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. We hope you guys enjoyed it, but that's going to end the NXT TakeOver Brooklyn 4 review. So be sure to tune back again for the SummerSlam review. And if you are listening to us offline, go over to Part 2 to listen to our SummerSlam review. For those listening live, we're going to take a quick break here, and then we'll be back up. Look for the link on Twitter. Uh, but that is it for the TakeOver Brooklyn 4 review. I'm your host, the self proclaimed grace host, Kyle Masters of The Lowdown Show right here in No Hole is Barred Wrestling Podcast joined by my usual co-host Hollywood Michael Chow NXB Brian and special guest co-host James from Badass Podcast we'll be right back <laughs> 